for the purpose of introduction, uh, here with us today is Professor uh, uh, John Frederick Steven uh, from Oregon State University, uh, USA. He shall be discussing on uh, research and research administration, I mean, administration of uh, research, a research laboratory. And uh, in the meantime, we want maximum uh, cooperation from participants. We must abide by uh, the uh, regulations governing uh, uh, class lecture that we must remain silent, behave well, behave very maturely as our professor is uh, busy uh, discussing on his topic. Uh, you can go ahead, sir. Uh, this lecture is actually initiated in Nigeria to support early career researchers, uh, not only early career researchers, but uh, graduates, MSc, as well as um, some professors that uh, require mentorship from a uh, resource person uh, from developed nations to share with us their experience, especially you as a director of research at Oregon State University. So we uh, will be receiving mentorship directly from you on how to establish a laboratory and how is the laboratory administered. In the laboratory, we expect there are doctoral students, postdoctoral uh, researchers and principal investigator. So how are these uh, 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 operating in the laboratory? Thank you very much. And quickly, I will now give the floor to Professor uh, Stevens to go ahead with his presentation. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. So thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, I'd like to give you a brief introduction of who we are at Oregon State University. I think this will take me uh, five to seven minutes. And then I will go into the, the actual topic of today's lecture. And then after 40, 45 minutes, I'll open it up for discussion and until the full hour. So Oregon State University is located on the west coast of the United States. It is between San Francisco and Seattle. Uh, as you can see, we have about 30,000 students. Our annual budget is, is over $1 billion and about 300 million of that is actually research funding that goes to the labs. So in the, the Oregon State has 11 colleges and um, um, we are in the College of Pharmacy, we are on two campuses. One is in Corvallis, the main site of Oregon State University. And the other site is in Portland where the hospital is. And there we have a department of pharmacy practice and some folks of pharmaceutics also that have their labs in Portland, Oregon on the, uh, in the uh, main city of Oregon. I'd like to mention that Oregon has about 10 universities and Oregon State is the largest research university in Oregon. Now I am also associated with the Linus Pauling Institute as a principal investigator, but also as associate director for research. Now Linus Pauling is the most well-known, most famous Oregonian that ever lived because he all by himself um, won the Nobel Prize twice, all by himself. So first he got the Nobel Prize in 1954 for the nature of the chemical bomb. And then in 62, he received the Nobel Prize, the Peace Prize. So he's very famous and he founded an institute that started out near San Francisco, Palo Alto in the Bay Area. And then in the year 1996, it moved to Oregon State where he came from and where he graduated in the chemical engineering. Now, in honor of uh, Dr. Pauling, we, uh, in, we have a Linus Pauling Institute. And when I first came to Oregon State University, we were in an old building, but now in 2011, we've got a new, brand new research building, as you can see here, with a very modern equipped labs. We have 12 investigators. Uh, we have uh, four adjunct faculty, 14 research staff, and uh, 13 PhD students, of which uh, Dr. Paraiso is one of them. I say Dr. Paraiso because he has a doctorate in, ph in pharmacy and now she's getting a PhD in medicinal chemistry. Now the areas of research that we are in is drug discovery, I would say of all these uh, bullets that you can so see here, uh, I, I would say I fall in the category of drug, drug discovery, but there's also gene regulation and disease, pharmacoepidemiology, uh, drug targeting, uh, drug use in pharmaceutical health services, and pharmacy practice, 
pharmacokinetic modeling, cardiovascular disease, and educational research. So many areas in pharmacy we are doing in our College of Pharmacy at Oregon State University. Now, now I'm going into um, the actual topic of today, and I call it the makings of a successful research laboratory. And uh, while many of the things, uh, all of the information is, is cited here, maybe you can see this book, this is called At the Helm, and it is called Leading Your Research Laboratory. And uh, well, uh, many years ago I read that book, and uh, it is actually very useful, and I recognize many of the issues that are addressed in that book. So when you start a laboratory at a university, many people don't realize it's actually you're running a small company. And this company that you run is called your lab. It has many similarities with a for-profit company. For instance, in a company, you would have a product that you make or sell. So the quality or a unique product makes you survive as a company. And what makes you survive as a research laboratory is good science. The other thing is, um, in a company, you would have proper timing of launching a product. In your lab, you need to know when to submit your proposal. What is a hot topic at what time? And then you try to get funding for that particular topic. Well, you need to have enough money. So in a company that's called uh, capital, and in the research laboratory, it's called funding. Now, how do you get the funding? Uh, funding, of course, you need to have it come up with a good idea or research ideas, but that's not the only thing. You also need to be able to sell it. Convince the funder, the foundation, the, the, the funding agency to fund your ideas. So you must be able to sell them. And that's a, not like writing a paper. It, it's a totally different skill that you need to acquire. The other thing is in a company you have people and people, um, are very important. And in, the, in, in your academic research laboratory, you need to have smart and enthusiastic people to work in the lab. It's not enough just to have people. These people need to be good. I can tell you in my research career, I started out as assistant professor, and now I'm a full professor. I can tell you each time I got a promotion, I can pin it down to the people that helped me to get there. So it's very important to have the right people at the right time. And of course, in a company, you have to have effective management. And in a research laboratory, you are the leader. It's called the principal investigator. And that, that person starts to keep the science and the people going. Uh, why is it? Oh. Now, oftentimes, you know, you're a student, you graduate. Some people go from graduation right into a faculty position. That happens. Uh, some of my people that are from Thailand, for instance, they go back and oftentimes they get a junior faculty position. Um, that's not so common though. Most people, they get first a postdoc and after a couple of years of postdoc, then they apply for a faculty position, they get interviewed and they get an offer. And that offer, um, you need to think about it carefully because this is what your what probably the rest of your life will look like. So you need to know how to negotiate. It's not only the amount of money that you're getting, there's much of stuff involved. For instance, um, teaching, can you choose the course that you're going to teach? Can you choose uh, students? The salary is of course important. If you're not negotiating well in terms of salary, well, that's the only time when you have say over your salary because the rest is just annual increases and that's not all that much nowadays. They're probably looking at them, they're giving you less. Now, the other thing is, is called startup, the lab funding in the beginning, make sure that the amount of money that you ask for is sufficient until the grant kicks in. Don't always think that, um, oh, I will sign anything because if the money that you're getting is not enough until your grant kicks in, then you're not going to be successful. Now, the positions in your lab, uh, you need to know from your department what is support for students, postdocs. Do you get that from uh, your institution? Uh, can you get uh, use from a, um, 
uh, lab assistant or an administrative assistant. These are all questions that you need to know. Then there's the other thing of discretionary funding. And that I find over the years more and more important because on a grant, you can only spend money on certain ways. What I do oftentimes is when I apply for a grant, for a grant um, I put my salary, partial support for myself in that grant. And that portion I can use to pay for stuff that is not in the grant because um, it, it's, it, the department pays me for the portion that's on the grant. And, and then I can take it as a kind of a um, savings account. And you can use it for if you have a visitor from abroad or so, you can take that person out for lunch. Or uh, oftentimes I um, have a couple of students go to a conference and that comes out of this fund because that is usually not in a grant proposal. Then the other thing is equipment. Equipment is very important. Without equipment, you cannot do research. So when you look at the situation at the new institution, be sure that all of the equipment that you need is there and it's in good condition and is available to you. You know, if you have a very important piece of equipment is there at the new institution, but if it belongs to somebody that will not allow you to use that, it's no use. So in that case, you need to request it. The other thing is of course, um, find out who pays for equipment, maintenance and service contracts. So a new piece of equipment can easily be several hundred thousand dollars, and we, <laughs> I know all about it. And after a while, it's like a car, it starts breaking down, and then it needs to be repaired. And if there's no money for the repair, then that equipment will um, maybe look good on the website, but it will not be useful to do research. So that's important to pay attention to. Personal support, uh, maybe sometimes the institution will pay for your moving, and uh, nowadays it's very important uh, that the institution also uh, finds opportunities for your partner. Um, then the thing is, when you start out, you need to find some identity. So plan the lab that you want. And the other thing is, and also think about the PI that you want to be. Now this is nowadays more and more important because when I started out, oh, I remember the days in the beginning, I could spend days on end doing research, but now you get more senior and then you sit on this committee, you sit on that committee and there's all this paperwork. So I'm here, my previous graduate student and chose not to be a professor because she hated the paperwork that I had to do every day. So one quote from the book is, for instance, well, a lot about being a PI, I do not like, and that's paperwork. But also look at the exciting things about being a professor. First of all, um, your day is always uh, is unpredictable. So that gives you, uh, it, it never gets boring. And you meet a lot of people. And um, having a lab of colleagues is just a wonderful thing. The other thing is not everybody can be a Nobel Prize laureate, you know, there's uh, very few people, the big guys, there's not so many, so most professors um, in Oregon State, we are, we are uh, no exception. Yeah, we do good research. We do get our grant funding, but we're not Nobel laureates. So you need to know, recognize the limits that you have. So that also means that we need to do good science and the good science will keep us forward and, um, and, and keeps getting our grant funding to do research. The other thing about being a professor is, yeah, you have power. And this is something, whether you like it or not, that's just by nature, that's the way it is. Now, this is very important because if you are exercising that power, you will alienate people, not only your students and your postdocs, but also your colleagues. So one person said, uh, you can't be a too hard ass at a big university because you must get the reputation of being kind. And I mean by that is I'm also sitting on the promotion tenure committees. If somebody has a reputation of, of making fights with your colleagues, then boy, then the vote will not be positive towards you. So you also need to be cognizant of your colleagues judging you. Now there's two kinds of uh, authorities. There's one that comes from scientific ability. 
So students, and especially when you get more senior, you've seen a lot of research, you've written, uh, written papers, you have read papers. So on, the, on average, you know more than your junior people. That means you, you get your respect uh, from the students and the postdocs. The other thing is, is called formal authority. Well, you are the boss in the end, so you're also an employer. Um, so that means you need to make decisions. Uh, and sometimes that is, it might be not so favorable for the people that work with you, but that's the way it is. There's no way around it. However, when you use that power, be very careful because if you are an authoritative person, it will not in, encourage creativity. Well, there's a, there's a uh, red line. I don't know what happened there. I didn't do that. Uh, the other thing is, can your boss be a friend? Now, I think over the years, there must be some uh, distance. Um, you, you, you just cannot be one of the gang. And that's in the beginning, it's difficult because when you start out, it's probably early 30s or mid 30s. I started out when I was in mid 30s. Uh, some of your folks, they're actually older than you are and then treat them as the employer, as the boss. That is sometimes very difficult. So what is, why is this, Ines, do you know why this red line is there on the middle of the screen? Never happened before. Um, do you want to leave the uh, we, we can just ignore it right yeah that works we can still uh, let's i i don't know what happened there um let's just ignore it um so then you have to develop your leadership style uh, and you need to just determine for yourself will you be more effective at the bench working in the lab or at the desk now early career researchers might need to troubleshoot experiments to get students and postdocs back on track. When the lab grows, you get more people, yeah, then you get more things to think about and to manage, and then it's better to spend the time at the desk. And, and what do you do there? You apply for grants and manage grants. So th this is now most of my time is that I spent nowadays is either getting a grant or, or dealing with it. And if you have multiple grants from the federal agency, there's much more rules now than there was uh, back in 2002 when I started out. Now, how do you make decisions? And this is, well, I'm from the Europe. So their leadership style is a bit different from the American style. The American style is um, to be cool and collected. That is what the book says. So that means if you lose temper, you show weakness and lack control. Now I've learned over the times that try not to lose your temper. This is very difficult sometimes when you get angry, but it's very important to uh, stay composed because once you do that then actually people cannot hear me is that it we can hear you we can hear you, we can hear you. somebody said something i don't know what, what what that person said well i i propose that i will finish first yeah, I will finish up first, uh, and then and then um, we can talk. We can do a discussion. Okay, will that work? So the other thing is, do you manage details or just deal with the big picture? Well. There's this, if you prefer the big picture managing style, that means that many of decisions that are detailed, others need to do that for you. And you need to learn, first of all, to trust those folks that you give the power to make decisions. So you need to be able to delegate. Now, the big picture is probably not good when you just start out, um, but it's the only way for a lab with multiple people and multiple brands if you're more senior because there is not enough hours in the day to do everything at the very detailed level. Now then there is time management. So as a professor, it's not only running a lab, right? You have to teach and you sit on committees, you've got to review uh, papers, you've got to 
write papers. There's all kinds of tasks. And if you, then you need to prioritize. So, and of course, in the, uh, and this is a matrix that comes out of the book. There is uh, urgent task and, and not so urgent tasks. And some are important and some are not so important. But you say on the top uh, left, you see, for instance, uh, deadline driven projects. Well, most of my time is getting the proposals that have a deadline in on time. So that means that oftentimes I need to, in the last couple of days, I get about three hours of sleep a night because I need to meet the deadline. It's very important. If you do not meet the deadline, then that will probably uh, diminish your success as a professor in the lab. And the, you know, the not urgent, not important, um, that's in the lower right one. Yeah, there is mail, there's email, web surfing. That is probably not very productive. So you really need to make sure that you keep that to an absolute minimum because you can easily spend all day answering emails and get nothing done. And that's not a recipe for success. So you need to find a balance between um, uh, important and unimportant tasks and to manage the time efficiently. Now, how can you um, set the priorities or manage your time? As I said before, one of the things is let other people do some tasks that you trust them to do. What I've done also is to learn to read faster you know, and avoid interruptions. So sometimes uh, in my office uh, in the morning, I have the doors open, but in the afternoon, if I want to write something on a paper, I just close the door. And that means that people, uh, well, they need to knock and that's probably enough barrier for them not to bother me. Well, and, the, and another thing is be prepared to say no. If you know you cannot do a certain thing, then say no. That's far better than making excuse. Now, for instance, I'm a editor for two journals, now maybe three. So I do not review anymore any manuscripts for other journals because there's, I don't have enough time to do that. So I focus on three journals. The other thing is you get, as a professor, you, you get every day, you get announcements of seminars and meetings. If you go to each and every one of them, you get nothing done. So do not attend each and every seminar. Then the other thing is committee work in the department. If you're a junior faculty member, yeah, you have to have some committee work. I realize that, but do not volunteer to do more than is expected from you. Uh, and then it's very important if you want to write your manuscript or you want to write your grant proposal, you really need several hours a day of uninterrupted writing time, reserved blocks of time for writing manuscripts or grant proposals. If you don't do that, this is the only way to submit a quality product before the deadline. And as I said before, if you miss the deadline, that is absolutely terrible because that's that will not help uh, to, for you to be a, a six, successful professor. Another thing about time management, nowadays we have email. When I was a grad student, there was no email. So now there is email and the emails we get, I get over hundred emails per day. And you, and you can easily spend answering these emails all day long. Is you can easily waste your time that way. You should not do that. Let, do not let your email run your professional life. So it is impossible to, leave hun to deal with the hundreds of emails and still get important tasks done. So you need to be you know, careful about what you do. The other thing is you get these emails. Well, never leave the subject line blank. If you, have a you send a message, put in the subject line what this is about. So for instance, if I work with, with a, on a grant proposal with other colleagues, it's called a program project or center proposal. I work probably with a dozen or so professors on a grant proposal, but to make sure that these, I, get, I manage those emails because each of those emails has probably important information, I write the title of the grant proposal in the subject line so I can find things quickly. The other thing is when I teach, and of course students, students they send me emails, and students, yeah, what they do is they probably write in there on the subject line a question. Well, that doesn't tell me anything because I, I did several courses. 
So I'm asking the students to write the course number in the subject line so I know what course this is about. And in one second, I know that I need to answer that question. Uh, when you make a request in an email or you recommend something, you really make sure that you delete the previous messages because there can be something in that, in that trail that is not good for the person who received that email. So you don't want to, to, that they receive that, so please get rid of that. The other thing is if you're a senior professor, yeah, you get many requests for recommendation letters or on the P&T committee, you need, to, you need to write a summary letter and they all have a certain format. They all have a certain things that you need to address. So save the, save the letter so it saves you time. So sometimes the, the, the framework of a letter, you can reuse them for a future opportunity. The other thing is what I learned from a previous director of our institute, uh, be careful what you write in emails because an email has a date stamp on it and it is saved somewhere. So if you uh, be, not be, a, let's say, um, polite in the email in the end, it might actually be a problem. So my previous boss at once, don't send an email when you're angry because you probably regret the next day what you wrote in that email. So it can have disastrous consequences. The other thing is do not delete emails because you need know, today I say, oh, I'm not in, interested in that. But later on, let's say a couple months from that, you say, oh yeah, I remember, I, there is something that I can use, but if you had deleted that email, it's no longer there. So I always keep each and every email, and nowadays it's very easy because you can store old emails on another server, and that's probably um, um, unlimited in order in, in for space. Now, if you're a junior professor, um, you, know, you don't have a lot of experience, and it's easy to get isolated. So early career researchers can become isolated, feel lonely, because who do you talk to? You know, the students, they think you're the professor and they think you know everything, right? But that's not the case. So what you can do as a junior professor is ask advice from a senior colleague. They probably have dealt with an issue that you're dealing with right now. So some departments work with a mentoring committee. It's very important for non-tenured uh, junior faculty at Oregon State University and all across the United States. You have a probationary period of about five years. And in the five years, you need to make a case that you're worthwhile hiring in the future. So it's better to early on um, seek advice because if you're not on track, you can actually use your, lose your position. Now, of course, this is on your side, but also your lab members. Don't let the lab members become isolated. So you must hold lab meetings regularly. There's no way around it. Even if you think you're busy and don't have any time, you still need to have those lab meetings because otherwise you do great damage to your group. The other thing that is good practice and that worked in my case, do not exclude lab members from lab meetings. So for instance, you've got three projects in your lab. Then when we discuss at the group meetings, these three projects, I invite everybody to come to the meeting because I do that because sometimes if there's a problem in one project, then sometimes somebody else in another project will have come up with a solution that you hadn't think of, thought of. So that's very good for, for, for coming up with new ideas to solve a problem. Now the other thing is very important is creativity. And creativity I know over the years is actually productivity. So creative, productive lab members are enthusiastic about the research. If there's no enthusiasm, they are not being creative. So you have to help them stay engaged. Keep the enthusiasm in your lab because unhappy people are not productive. Choose your people. So, you know, when you start out, you've got your new lab, then the lab is completely empty. There's only space. And then the urge is to hire people left and right and, and not pay attention to who they are. Well, that's a mistake because recruiting um, is essential. So unproductive average people will not help you reach your goals and move your research forward. Actually, 
average people can drag you down because they take much of your time that you're not being productive. So in the beginning, as I said, the lab is empty. And what you do is, of course, you ask, try to recruit people, but they need to be good. So in the meantime, you can actually work in the lab yourself, establish uh, methods and, and get the equipment to work. So there's not time lost. The other thing I learned over the, over the years is, is higher career driven people. And what I mean by that is, for instance, PhD students, well, they're in the program because they want to achieve something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so PhD students are career driven, but not the local postdocs or technicians. You know, in, in town like Corvallis, we have lots of postdocs uh, here. Uh, they, they might be uh, partners of somebody and they're looking for a job, but they're not, I found not the ones that are most productive because to them, they're not interested in the research, they're interested in the salary. So they don't care who they work for. So the other thing is if I hire from outside, I always look at the CV and, and see what they published. So if they have no papers there or very few, then you know they aren't writers and they won't deliver manuscripts in your lab. So that means uh, I stay away from them. Uh, the other thing is when you take on a graduate student, a PhD student, well, that's a commitment and that's a kind of a risk because you are responsible for graduating them. If, you, if they don't graduate, that means you have failed and that news will spread quickly. So if you become, uh, build a reputation that you cannot graduate students, then um, future students will leave you alone. So that's not good. So always make sure that you get the right student and that when you have the right student, make sure they graduate because graduate means success and success builds upon success and that you build a reputation of a lab where you can get a degree. Then the other thing is the, uh, of course, you deal with money, right? It's like, as I said, it's a little company and the little company um, uh, spends money and the money is always in short supply. Uh, there's, it doesn't matter what country you're in. So you need to um, spend your money wisely. So for instance, uh, most of, let's say 90% of the money that I spend in my lab is actually people. It's salary. Only 10% is chemicals and equipment and whatnot. So you need to make sure that your lab members are productive. So you need to make sure that they understand what you expect from them. So when they're not on track, so when they're um, having problems with the project, and it can be because of the project, but it can also be of attitudes in the lab, you need to talk to them. And if it really doesn't work out for you, then don't be afraid to end the contract if you cannot get that, fact, that person to be productive in the lab. Train your lab members so they can become productive and do not waste money due to inexperience. And this is mostly, um, this is undergrad students that we have in the lab. They can actually waste a lot of money. So to limit the, the money that they spend in the lab, uh, meaning doing an experiment only once, is to make sure that they understand what they're doing. So at Oregon State, we have standard operating procedures for equipment, but also for safety. As I said, uh, we have regular group meetings, and I mix them. Again, that's first of all, it's to monitor progress in the lab. So we have formal meetings, which I chose, but we have also informal meetings where we have roundtable discussions. And that's because to, to, you know, stay for the people to stay engaged, uh, and foster creativity because you know in those meetings you get ideas and these ideas that lead to creativity and as we all know without creativity you will not win grants. Spend your money wisely. So do not buy equipment that you can borrow or use in somebody else's lab and when you do buy equipment negotiate aggressively. So a piece of equipment that's sold to a company um, is probably um, they pay more than you do because you can get academic discount and that can be as high as 30%. Know what your budget is and plan accordingly. So when you receive funds for multiple years in the first year, do not spend it all in the first year. 
So I remember I was on a um, panel committee uh, that was for people in Chile. And they got a grant for five years and they got all the money in the first year and they had budgeted five students in the first year. That professor, what he did was he hired 25 students in the first year. Well, that won't work because then in the second year, you've got no money anymore and all of the people will leave the lab and then you cannot finish your project and in the end, you will not get new money. So this is not good. You really need to plan uh, expenses in your lab. Um, taking some risk is okay. Yeah? So if the data that you get from experiments, think, develop, or, or some new hypothesis comes out of that, well, test that hypothesis. So that means if you think a certain assay kit or chemical will help you to, to, to find support for your hypothesis, well, don't be afraid and, and, and get that, that assay or chemical because you can find something new and there can be a meaning a new paper or also a new grant proposal. If you only do what's in the grant, and I, I've learned this the hard way, you won't get the next one because that's not how it works in the, in the, in the grant application landscape. The other thing is you can collaborate with colleagues that offer a service or resource you need, but you don't have access to it. Yeah. Now I work with people from Thailand and they had one person from Gabon and they have come to my lab and they do, uh, let's say they do uh, very sophisticated mass spectrometry experiments. It works both ways because they bring an interesting project. We give them the data and that leads to a joint paper and sometimes it also leads to a joint grant. Now you need to be careful because um, if there is intellectual property involved, you need to be sure that you first set up a collaborative agreement before such a project starts. Then another good idea is to identify funding sources for your students to conduct research somewhere else or abroad. Because what they do is they be there for a couple months, they learn a new technique, they come to your lab and they have new skills and that you can take advantage of. Uh, grant management, I mentioned it briefly before. Well, work with your department's accountant to know how you're doing on your budget. Not only do not overspend because that's terrible because then you get in trouble with your department head, but also on a grant, if it runs, it comes to the end, make sure all the funding has been spent out because if you have money left over at the end of the grant, then they may take it back. You know, when I was a junior faculty member, I had a collaborator in Germany and we got a grant funds and, uh, but that collaborator in Germany didn't give me the samples. There was something, there was some problem there. So I told the granting agency, I said, well, I can't do the research. Here is your money back. I was being honest, right? Well, it was a big mistake because they never ever gave me money anymore because they thought, well, if you give money to Dr. Stevens, then he won't be able to do what he plans to do. So that's not good. So if, if that happens, if you can't really do exactly what's on the grant, then you tell your granting agency, can you use the money for something else? And that is far better. And I've learned that the hard way because this was a small grant in the beginning, but now I'm dealing this with a much larger scale. Organize your lab uh, resources. It's very important for each and every member in your lab to keep a detailed lab journal. Because what you really want is you don't want to do an experiment ideally only once. So that means everything that's done on an experiment needs to be written down. Now what we do in the lab is you have an experiment number, date, origin of the sample, the substance, and um, also um, the findings that comes out of the, is written down in that. And we work with spectroscopic data, for instance. So, well, that cannot all be in the lab journal. So there needs to be another system where you log those spectra or outcomes of a piece of equipment. And that needs to be written down in the lab journal where you can find them. Because otherwise, it, um, it's a spectrum of sample one. If you, after two years, you don't know anymore what it was from. Now, in my lab, we use a unique three-letter code. So if you looked at my CV, for instance, I've had 80 people in the lab. Well, you know, and they all put samples in the fridge that says sample 12, yeah? So if I see a vial in, in, the, in, the, in, in the fridge with sample 12, 
well, that doesn't, that means only something for the people who put it there. So what we do in the lab is we have uh, three letter codes. In my case, it's JFS, John Friedrich Stephen, JFS, and then the experiment number, experiment number 500, and then sample 12, because then you can go to the lab journal and find what that sample 12 really is. Very important is to keep custody of the lab results. Meaning if somebody leaves the lab, make sure you get all the data because that person will leave the lab, start a new job, and you sit with the data to write a manuscript. So it's very important that you know where everything is. The other thing is make sure you know where the cells, the bacterial strains, reagents are because you don't want, if somebody cannot find something, what they'll do is they'll, they'll buy it again. So that's a waste of money. And of course, keep track of lab expenses. So I found over the years that, you know, money is dealt with at a university or the department level, and they make mistakes. They make, they have accounting errors, and it's very common. So you gotta check what you spend, because you now for in my case, so I've been paying a postdoc in somebody else's lab for, for several months until I found out, and then you need to check that, because if you don't, then your money will disappear left and right. Another thing is somebody, um, years ago, uh, I said, well, uh, what grant number do you want to use to buy for the freezer? Well, I say I didn't order a freezer. Well, that's because the grant numbers, they all look the same at Oregon State University and somebody made an error and made you pay for it. So that you, you have to avoid that. Then the last slide, and then I open it up for discussion. You know, this is all trouble and it is easy to get into trouble and I've been in trouble myself and, and it is very common. So you need to get out of that and, and you, usually if you do the right thing, you'll be okay. So you think, why am I doing all this and is it worth the trouble? Because you spend a lot of um, time and, and enthusiasm in it. Well, what's the payout? Well, that's called success and success comes at, 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 at in many forms. And if you have that, you need to celebrate because that's important to keep the morale in the lab, but also um, to, as a motivation to move forward. So if you have a very complex experiment and you complete it, well, it's time to say, okay, we did it. We went right. Let's celebrate that. When you complete a manuscript, and you submit for publication. Well, it is an achievement, okay, it's not yet published, but nevertheless, it was submitted and, and that's, a, that's an achievement. They need to celebrate. Getting a manuscript accepted for publication, that's always, well, I've written over or published over 130 papers, but every time I do that, I still have a very good feeling because that means it is in the literature, it's in the public domain, and that's part of you that comes part of your CV and your, your track record. So it's very important to celebrate that. You know, when you submit your grant proposal, yeah, I can sit at my desk and write the proposal, but oftentimes you need preliminary data. And actually your students and your postdoc, they help you to get that data that you um, uh, put in your grant proposal. And oftentimes that is the most w best way to convince the funding agency to give you the money. And oftentimes they can clearly point out a certain figure in a grant proposal can say, well, that was the winning grant uh, figure in the grant proposal and you need to celebrate that. Of course, winning a grant is always a reason to celebrate graduation of a student. It is an important point in your life and you need to celebrate that. When a postdoc lands a very good position in industry or gets hired into an independent academic position, you might think, oh man, I'm losing my best person and uh, you're gonna be sad about it. Well, don't be, because that person got that position because he built his career in your lab and you can be very proud of that. And the other thing is that is an accomplishment that will very look very well on your CV and may help you to recruit new productive lab members because news spreads and if you become known as the lab where people get jobs in industry, well, they'll write you emails about, can I come to your lab? And that's the place where you wanna be because in the beginning, nobody asked you that. You have to be more active in getting your people in the lab. And finally, uh, when you do everything right at the university, you get promoted to associate professor or full professor. 
and, and this is also things that you've got to be thankful for because it is not only you that did that, but it's also the people in your lab that helped uh, you to, to reach your goals. And on this note, um, as I said, I would finish up after 40 minutes and I open it up for discussion. So now people can unmute and ask their questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Stevens. Uh, Pre Professor Stevens has uh, discussed extensively on setting uh, a laboratory. He, I'm Tijani speaking, Dr. Tijani uh, Salim. Oh, hi. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> Good to see you again. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I would like to inform the participants that we first met uh, with uh, Professor Stevens uh, during the conference in Germany. I, I wasn't opportune to attend the conference, but while searching for the uh, speakers, the top speakers of the conference, Polyphenols, in 2019 or 2018, 2018, 2018, then I saw uh, the name of Professor Stevens and the kind of work he carries uh, in his laboratory. He does in his laboratory uh, related to polyphenols. And thereafter, I developed interest to work with him. I immediately composed an email and sent him uh, while trying to look for a potential mentor uh, in the process of seeking for postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, he immediately, I think within a few hours, maybe two hours or three hours, immediately I got his response positively that uh, he is willing to work with me. Unfortunately, I applied for a Fulbright Fellowship last year. I was not successful, although the result was not declared. So I will be trying this year again. I hope to work with Professor Steven. Hopefully I shall travel to Oregon to work with him in his own laboratory. Actually, he is working on natural products. Uh, and I work uh, specifically on natural products, uh, targeting hypertension, diabetes, chronic inflammatory disease in particular. And that is the area where uh, Professor Steven is working. Specifically, he works on uh, xanthohumol. Mm -hmm. And presently, Irene uh, is from Benin. Earlier, there was one person, uh, Dr. I can't remember his name, who worked also in his own laboratory, also from Benin. So Professor Steven has trained a couple of African scientists uh, over the years, whether doctoral or postdoctoral fellowship. So here he is. It is an opportunity for you guys to ask any question related to uh, research involving laboratory. He is currently a director of research at Oregon State University. Thank you very much, Professor Steven. And the floor is open for people to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Tijani, you know, with grant writing, I forgot to mention, I need to write 10 proposals to get one funded. But because I keep doing it and don't give up, I always sure. get grant funding. So I advise to you, my advice to you is, you keep trying and you will succeed. It is impossible. Sure. That with good science, you never get funding. That's impossible. So just don't lose faith and 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 just do it. You will be successful. I, I, I just know. Thank you very much, sir. So the floor is open for anyone willing to ask any question, please. Um, hi, hi, Professor Stevens. Hi. Uh, Are you still the, in the uh, uh, Dr. Charles speaking? Are you still in Singapore? No, no, I, I'm in Nigeria. We, we spoke yesterday. Um, I spoke extensively yesterday. I gave you an insight on um, the kind of researches we do here and how our research is in Nigeria. So, do you so have a my... Comment? So my, my, my question is, um, I, I haven't really got into the stage of, um, of course, employing or getting people to work with me. I'm still an early career academic. But I, I have always wondered that successful researchers like you, how do you actually recruit your postdocs and your PhD students? Is it... Um, is it a magic wand you have, or is it sometimes just sheer uh, luck? Yeah, it's, it, it, in the beginning, I had to find the people. 
right? You, you, nobody knows you. You've got no papers. Nobody, you're, a, you're not very well known in the field. So in the beginning, it is difficult because, you know, people want to be work with famous people. That, that's the nature of the thing. So in the beginning, I do agree that um, it, was, it was difficult to find people. But that is part of recruiting. You need to be selling your your, your project and, 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 and have to offer them something that they are interested in. And if it didn't work out, then don't hire them because if you're somebody in the lab who only rakes in a salary, that's not good for you. So you need to be have enthusiastic people. Now, of course, after so many years, and this is now, we're now probably in year 18, and I've now had 80 people in the lab. Well, more recently, or let's say the last 10 years, people recruit me. So, is Ines, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Can you tell me how you came to our lab? Um, the first time I was doing a farm D in the city. Okay, just a second. Okay, yes, I was doing a farm D in Poitiers and um, I was doing it alongside a master's. So for that master's, um, I needed an internship in the research lab. So actually that's not how we met. The first time we met was me taking your class. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I met you through another student, Oriane, who was taking, uh, who was doing her internship in your lab. So when two years later I wanted to do mine, I sent you an email and that's, where it went from yeah and i can tell you now you're now graduating in december because you're well on the way to get there and the reason i thought that you were a very good student is because if you came from france from benin you went to france and then you want to go to the united states that that tells me that you have energy in you that you have you have initiative and that usually bodes very well for being productive. If you have people that stay in a little town and they stay there forever, no, no, go nowhere, that means that they're not very innovative or creative or, or self-driven. So usually I look for people that have shown initiative and, and Ines is certainly an, a good example of that. So that's why I recruited her to my lab. And, and that was, I think Ines is, well, like many of my students, is, is, she is an outstanding student, I can tell you that. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Stevens. So important is also to build relationships. So I have a network of professors all over the world. If they come up with a suggestion for a good postdoc or a student, well, I listen to that because they have the experience with that person that I don't have yet. To give you one example, I know now that when Ines is, is graduating in, in, in December and she will leave the lab and, and find her own position as a professor somewhere in, in the world, I'm getting a, a student from Italy because I built a relationship with several universities in Italy and they write to me, I have a student that wants to do a PhD in your lab. Well, of course, if they get recommended by a colleague that I know, they will never recommend somebody that is no good because their own reputation is on the line as well. So I listen to that too. And that's how I get the people in the lab. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And the other, as I said before, you know, people might be knocking on your door but you don't really want people, the first one that comes along, because if that person is no good and you've got your precious startup dollars or, or money, and that money is wasted on the student that is not doing anything, well, then you lost your chance to be successful. So way in the beginning, be careful who you pick. And it's better to wait a while to, to find the right person to help you in your lab. And as I said, well, well several years ago, I wanted a postdoc and I really wanted the postdoc, but the person was not available. It was working on a grant proposal in somebody else's lab. 
and I waited for six months for that person to come to my lab. And that person that was 10 years ago, now it was eight years ago, and that person is still with us at Oregon State University, started out as a postdoc in my lab, and is now a laboratory manager at Oregon State University. So that was, boy, that, he was just brilliant, he was very good. And I'm glad I waited six months to get him to my lab. So sometimes patience is good. Other questions? Now is your chance, don't be afraid. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Prof. Good afternoon, Prof. Um, I don't believe I uh, good afternoon, Prof. Oh, good afternoon. Oh, good morning. <laughs> Hi, Prof. Yeah. Sorry, I, I do not consider the time zone difference. Yeah. I'm okay. by name. I'm by name Adebo. Yeah. And uh, yes, a PhD candidate at, at Hosman Dampudi University. Mm -hmm. Uh here in Nigeria, sometimes research can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. I did my master's in the same university. I worked on the leprosy patient isolating bacteria from the leprosy ulcer, then carrying out a plasmid curing on some resistant bacteria, and at the same time, curing the plasmid using the acridine orange. Uh, right now, the PhD program, you know how it is uneasy for a student who doesn't have any income and uh, hoping to have uh, the certificate and at the same time contributing to the nation. So right now, sometimes I become confused on sponsoring as the sponsorship of the program. And uh, I wish to order more on the already isolated bacteria, by bacteria. So how can you advise me now on the setup and the management within yeah. the Time well, frame. Exactly. And, okay. We have a similar issue at Oregon State University because when I was a graduate student in the Netherlands, uh, that was after I got my master's degree, and then you go into your PhD program, and the only thing you do then, you, you um, do research. But at Oregon State University, which is probably then very similar to your program, the students that come to your lab, yeah, they need to take credits. They need to take courses as well. Well, so what you what what I tell them is, okay, you take so many credits for your course work that is needed, of course, but there's also an expectation from the professor to make um, to make progress in the lab. So for that, we have at Oregon State University we have um, mentoring and what is it, the monitoring progress um, uh, progress meetings every year. And if a student is not making sufficient progress in the lab, then that might actually lead to that person not being able to progress in the program. So there's clearly also an expectation that the student makes progress in the lab and not only uh, doing the coursework. So there's an expectation and that needs to be communicated very clearly to the student. That what is the expectation? But on the whole, I said, uh, for let's say at Oregon State University, and Ines is, is, uh, is, knows all about this. When she was uh, first uh, in the lab, she needed to take courses, and she still takes maybe a couple courses because she is also in the um, uh, what is it, business degree program. Well, that works fine if you do time management well. Once they um, do the prelim oral exam, so that's about after two and a half years, they do a prelim oral, that's an exam, and if they pass that exam, yeah, then they become officially doctoral candidates, and then they need to make full-time uh, progress in the lab, and they get about with two years to finish up the thesis work. So I would say is make sure that uh, the student understands what your expectations are, and then be a common, you have to accommodate that, that that's the way of the PhD program, there's nothing you can do about that. But of course, you're absolutely right. If you plan experiments, especially with cell culture or bacterial cultures, uh, this is something something needs to be done on maintenance of the of, of these cells. Yeah, that 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 needs to be planned very carefully because this cannot be done um, 
let's say on Wednesday at three o'clock in the afternoon when the student has time. So that doesn't work. So you need to be sure that that system or the, or the, um, what is it? The agenda, the, the, the schedule that the student has uh, fits your, fits your um, uh, yeah, uh, research program. So it needs to come both ways. But I have had students that spend all of the time on studying for exams and that's just not acceptable because it is designed in a way that they can probably spend half of the time in the lab, even in the, even in the first year. Thank you I very hope much. this answers your questions a bit. Uh, thank Hi, you very much. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Hi, yes. Hi, Professor Steven. Go ahead. Hi. Okay. Uh, once again, I'm Dr. Tijani from Nigeria. Yeah. In, res yeah, in response to uh, the previous uh, question, actually, the reason why we choose that you should discuss on uh, research and administration of research laboratory is to provide orientation or information related to what is a laboratory? How is it governed? I mean, how the laboratory, what are the people that are inside the laboratory? For instance, um, in Nigeria, uh, like in the university where I currently teach and conduct research, it's the same laboratory where the previous speaker is undergoing his PhD program. That is the university where I currently teach and conduct research. I would like to tell uh, Professor Stephen that there is no professor in the university with his own laboratory. The laboratories are usually general laboratories where yeah. you have undergraduate students. If for instance, it is an undergraduate student laboratory. If for example, it is a postgraduate laboratory, you could find MSc students at their final year when they are conducting research or PhD students that are conducting research. Under normal circumstances, because I did my PhD, MSc and PhD in New Delhi. So the situation there is somewhat similar to that of USA and any other developed nation. Unlike here in Africa, I think I might have shared an article that I wrote in January this year uh, related to challenges first or experience by early career researchers in Africa. I don't know if I have shared it with you. I, I've read the article. So I have, I have summarized a couple of challenges that we face. Among them is laboratory space. Apart from laboratory space, is we also have challenges of ordering chemicals. For instance, you could find that we have difficulty in purchasing certain chemicals from Sigma. We'll have to order them, for instance, from the United States of America. They take a couple of months before they arrive. And perhaps if they are degradable items, before they arrive, if it is an enzyme, it might have lost its biological function. So apart from this, we also have issues of funding. And that is exactly what the previous uh, speaker or question uh, was asking related to funding. Uh, funding is a major issue in Nigeria. There are quite a few number of funding bodies like the Tertiary Education Trust Fund, the Petroleum Technology Development Agency, all these provide funds. But unfortunately, you might have seen in my article, I have uh, explained that this kind of funding are usually given to senior academics, those established professors. And unfortunately, again, they do not have laboratories of their own where their students, MSc students and PhD students can sit comfortably and work. While I was doing my PhD, I worked in about three or four laboratories. There was a protein, uh, uh, protein biochemistry laboratory, the main biochemistry laboratory, my own supervisor's laboratory, the central instrumentation facility laboratory, and computational chemistry laboratory. So all these laboratories are fully accessible to all PhD students 24 hours. Unfortunately, here in Nigeria, these kind of PhD students do not have the same scenario. So I, because of these challenges that I summarized in that article, I built courage to initiate this program that we call Mentorship and Career Guidance in Nigeria, whereby we invite certain eminent established professors anywhere they are from the world. We invite them to deliver certain lectures online via this Zoom, just like the one that you have just presented, so that we change the mindsets of people here in Nigeria to see how exactly research is conducted. By the time they get placed as uh, lecturers or research assistants, 
on their own, they will initiate how to establish their own laboratory because they might have been informed by people like you who are actually excellently doing well in research. So actually, I am very grateful in particular on behalf of uh, our foundation that you have explained exactly what is a laboratory and what, who and who are working in a laboratory. Usually, like you have said, in the laboratory, you could find MSc students, you can equally find PhD students, and there are a couple of uh, postdoctoral fellows who are usually recruited from anywhere in the world. They could be within the country where the PI is working, or they could be also from outside the country. But for instance, if assuming I was, I'm able to avail the Fulbright Fellowship or any fellowship from uh, your own laboratory, I will have an opportunity to travel to the United States of America and to work within a year or two in your own laboratory to learn certain techniques that are there, you know, operating in your own laboratory. So I'm just making this explanation for you to understand and also for the participants to also embrace the information that you have provided that the laboratories are not similar to the laboratories that we have here in the country or in Africa, where you have a couple of MSc students sitting in the same lab doing their own individual work. Each MSc student or PhD student has his own independent supervisor. So the supervisor has his own laboratory space where his students are working. All his chemicals and reagents are there because they buy chemicals and reagents from the grants they have availed. And students have opportunity to use the chemicals and reagents to conduct research. And from their own findings, manuscripts are written and the PI go through the manuscripts, review them, and then they get published. And the PI, both the PI and the graduate student or PhD students get recognition or credits as a result of publishing their work. Thank you very much, Professor no, no, Steve. Thank you very much. It was, um, it was a pleasure to be with you. And I wish everybody um, that is in your position best of success. And uh, uh, su uh, effort will prevail. So persistence pays off. So keep at it and you will succeed. Um, so lastly, I will give maybe one or two people uh, opportunity to ask uh, if there are some more questions so that we can now allow Professor to go and relax. It is already around uh, 9 to 10 a.m. Oregon time. We really appreciate because of the time difference. I would like to tell the participants that it is a huge sacrifice Professor Stephen has made. We have been exchanging email uh, a number of days ago. Like for instance, we had a pre-meeting last uh, yesterday where we discussed extensively how to conduct this uh, today's meeting. Uh, certainly, we have inconvenienced him because it is already early morning. We made him to come out around 8.30 a.m. Oregon time while we are here around 4.30 or 5 or so. Thank you very much. I would like to give more chance to two or people to ask questions or make some few comments before you finally go. Anybody with another question? Uh, to, to make more comment on what I have said earlier, uh, Prof, when you look at the host, you know the reality of uh, where I'm talking from, the angle, the perspective on which I'm talking from. But I don't want to be too forward because they are my masters. They are my masters. There, uh, we have them, and I'm just a student. I am not working with them, though I also work with them as a student. So he has spoken, and I really encourage his braveness. When you look at him, he's brave, and uh, he has done well with his colleague. He, among them, we have uh, Doctor. Some student, as you see him when he was talking. So they, they are really uh, young scientists that are encouraging. They are really encouraging. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Mm -hmm. And he has spoken. So. You're most welcome. Thank you. So finally, uh, I will say a big thank uh, to Professor Steven. And we look forward to continue collaborating with you uh, in the near future whenever the need arrives. And I will equally uh, extend uh, our appreciation to the participants that uh, accepted our invites from all over the world. I mean, from wherever they are. There are participants here, Professor Stephen from India. Some are from Saudi Arabia. Some are from Nigeria. And some are from neighboring African countries. So I would like to congratulate you for having mentored a couple of scientists from entire world. Because uh, I can tell you, I, like I told you, there are people from India they have participated here, people from within African region. And I would also like to appreciate the kind help of uh, Irene, Dr. Irene. Dr. Irene, sincerely, uh, we do appreciate all your efforts, and I look forward to seeing you at Oregon when I come for my postdoctoral fellowship. Thank you very much, Professor Steven. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes.
Vai, Sandra.